she's still involved in that church. She's still a, a, a stewardess in the church. My father, on the other hand, was um, son of a two Baptists. And he was grew up in the church, but when he was an adolescent, he decided to abandon the church totally. So he was an atheist for all of my life and didn't have any um, shame about letting people know that there was no God. And uh, occasionally he and my mother may get into a conversation about it, but it wasn't something that was a big topic in our family. But I was aware that there was a kind of a, a gap there. So I grew up with this split heritage, and my father, even though he was an atheist, he didn't have any resistance about my sister and I going to church. So we grew up going to my mother's church primarily, which was in Columbus, Georgia. And my church was about a five-minute ride from my neighborhood, which was kind of a middle-class integrated neighborhood. But in this neighborhood were several churches, one of which was a Baptist church that has my grandfather's name on the cornerstone. My father would always tell me that he was a deacon of this church, but he didn't really practice religion because back in those days, men in the community attended the church sort of as helpers and worked for the church in a more utilitarian way. We grew up on military bases because my dad was also in the army. So one of my earliest memories of going to church was going to Sunday school in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, when I was around eight years old. And they would pick us up on school buses and take us off the base to an elementary school where we had Sunday school. And that's where I learned my first hymn, Old Rugged Cross. And I think for some reason that just stays in my mind as kind of the foundation of my religious upbringing. But when I returned around 12, 13, I began to start wondering about church. And I began to visit other churches in my neighborhood, particularly the one that had my grandfather's name on the cornerstone. It's called Winton Hill Baptist Church. And one day I just told my mother, I said, listen, I think I'm gonna go to church down the street. That's where all my friends went to church. And I began to go to church there. And then I began to go to church where my grandmothers went to church. And eventually I just began to feel a sense that there were other ways to worship. And I was interested in all of them. So I say now that I think that may have been the opening where my mind began to kind of broaden and stretch out. I went to school in Atlanta um, at Morehouse College and it's a Baptist school traditionally. It was started by the Baptist church. White Baptist ministers started the church, the school. And every Tuesday and Thursday we had what we call assembly or chapel. So we had to go to chapel, but it wasn't a chapel that was uh, a worship service. We had speakers from all over. We had presidents, former presidents, statesmen, uh, corporate leaders would come and talk to us about business. So there my mind began to expand even further. And from there I graduated, came to Texas, joined a Baptist church, went to Europe, spent some time away from the church, but found myself um, listening to a Methodist minister through a tape uh, subscription. And he was a liberal interpreter of the Bible. And I believe he opened me up even further to understand that there were ways to understand even the Christian experience that wasn't as literal as I had been raised to believe. And um, I turned back to Texas in 91, knowing I was a different person with regard to my religious journey. And then I discovered a, another church. I, was, um, began, I met my ex-wife, and in that time that we were dating, I began attending her church, and her church was a United Methodist church that was run by a pastor named Zan Holmes. He's a very affluent minister in the Dallas area and was once a state representative. And he preached a liberation theology, which we'll talk about during my talk. And that opened me up even further to understand how the Christian experience can bear upon African American life and just life in general, not only in religion, but also in the areas of 
economic development, politics, finance, community development, and so forth. And from there, I went to seminary. I went to a United Methodist Seminary, Perkins, which is at SMU in Dallas. Then I transferred from there and went to Bright Divinity School, which is a, another um, institution run by the church. It's run by the Disciples of Christ, which is another moderately liberal Christian denomination. And then from there, I um, was ordained as a United Methodist minister. But during that period, as I was going through my ordination process, I discovered the Unitarian Church. And there I began to really question my own um, convictions and belief about religion. And within a matter of time, I was switching again to uh, the free thinking um, way of doing religion. And I also became a um, Air Force chaplain, which is another ecumenical environment where we have people of all different faiths, non believers as well that I have to or find myself um, ministering to and caring for. And now I'm teaching. And as I said, now I feel like I've kind of lived in this world of paradox because most of my students are studying to be pastoral counselors. The majority of them are Christians and many of them are ministers. Some of them are professional um, licensed counselors. And they see themselves as um, living out the Christian experience. So while I have these students, I also am open to them that they know I'm a Unitarian, but I don't necessarily put myself out there as a, um, a humanist, because I don't want to be, uh, what we say in the, in the religious terminology, is a stumbling block for someone. <laughs> I'm sure y'all have all heard this term, a stumbling block, this comes out of the Bible. You don't want to get in someone's way of what they're trying to do. So now I find myself um, where I am today. I consider myself a spiritual humanist, which means that while I don't adhere to Christian doctrine, I do respect all points of view. I try to uh, respect other points of view. And I understand from my own way of living that there's a, a realm of the human experience that goes beyond the mundane. And I call that transcendence, where we're together with someone, for example, and you feel like you've had a conversation that makes you especially close, that you've made contact person to person, spirit to spirit, soul to soul. And that, for me, is where I consider the realm of transcendence. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of my personal journey. I just wanted to get that out there so that you don't have to guess you know, where I'm coming from. Today I want to talk about Bridging the Gap. That's the title of my talk. It's a way that we can understand the roots of black religious experience. The black church is a part of black religious experience. It's not the same. I want to be clear about that. And also, how can we or persons who adhere to a humanist, perhaps an atheist perspective on life, be in partnership or bridge a gap that stands between the two in most everyday experience. So I'm going to start off giving a little historical perspective on the African American religious experience and how it originated. Donald has already given us a little of his background also. But I believe it's good to understand that African Americans are not what we consider a monolithic group or a monolithic um, people. That means that there's no one way to look at African Americans and say, this is how they are. There's a writer by the name of Toure, who's one of those one name persons like Bono and Cher, Madonna, <laughs> that writes for the New York Times and for um, several media outlets. And he says, he has a book out called, Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness? And we like to look at, at Obama as a person that's post-black, meaning that he's transcended what we consider black, a black person's life or just race, race the, the distinction between race and class. And he says that if you see a room of 100 people, well, you have 100 ways to be black because everybody in the room is going to be different in some form or fashion. 
Well, African American religion is similar. If you go to five different African American churches, chances are each church is going to be distinct in some form or fashion. African American Baptist Church versus African American United Methodist Church. It's going to be quite different in how they view the world, how they interpret scripture, and how they live out their beliefs in the world. But it's good to under, understand that African American religion, as we know it on U.S. soil, arose out of a situation of oppression and slavery. And I say that because African Americans came over either as slaves, <clears throat> some came over as free people, but the majority of them came over in the 18th century, 16th century, 17th century, I'm sorry, either as slaves or persons in some form of bondage. And out of that experience is where the religious experience that we see now originated. And people will say that African Americans came from a land that was full of rites and rituals where many African religions, tribal religions, um, groups that practice certain forms of native earth religion in Africa. And this sort of primed the slaves and those who came over for um, American religion or particularly British forms of religion. And I say that they were oppressed and enslaved people dealing with the vicissitudes of life and needing a source of hope and transcendence. Now the vicissitudes of life is a word that I use to describe the hardships that slaves had to endure. They were in shackles, they were closely guarded, they were whipped, beaten, had taken, lost all their liberties and all their freedoms, and they were under a constant burden of oppression. And anybody who is living under oppressive conditions needs some form of hope to get through the difficult times. African Americans um, needed a narrative that they could connect to that allowed them to feel as if there was something beyond the present time that they found themselves in. And I would say that the biblical narrative of liberation that we know of or we have probably been exposed to in the Old Testament of the Israelites being enslaved and oppressed and bound in Egypt is that narrative that many African Americans or many slaves latched onto. They heard the stories from their masters, from um, slave preachers in these secret church gatherings. And this was a narrative that they could identify with pretty much step in step, lock, step, and barrel. You have a group of Israelites who were stuck out in the desert for 40 years under bondage by the Egyptians. Then you have African slaves who were here in the U.S. under bondage for decades. So the biblical narrative of liberation offers a vision of God guiding them through this difficult time. That was what I would say is kind of the origin or what made um, African Americans so connected with religion. In the book, Black Pioneers in a White Denomination, written by one of my Unitarian Universalist colleagues, Dr. Mark Morrison Reed. He says that blacks in America became loyal to the Bible when they discovered that it spoke to their experience in slavery. I just want to read a little bit more of that just to give you a sense of what he was trying to say. He says that no matter how the slave master abridged the Bible, he could not hide his basic message of freedom for the oppressed. The slave's ability to see beyond the corrupted word they were taught was a critical act of intellectual freedom. Their reinterpretation of the biblical message and its incorporation into black reality through the creation of the spirituals was a creative act. I believe this is quite important because it gives us a, a real historical grounding of why and how long African Americans have been tied to the church is kind of the root of all African American experience. Now I talked about James Cone who was a liberation theologian. He was a professor of theology at Union Theological School Seminary of Columbia University in New York.